Well, good afternoon, everyone, and please sit down. Uh, Alan Noble, um, Executive Director and Distinguished Service Professor, uh, Dr. Emil Bollingater, Carnegie Mellon faculty and staff, students and graduates, families and friends. I'm Colin Underwood, the Director of Programs at Carnegie Mellon University, Australia. And on behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome you all to the graduation ceremony, which marks the achievement of our soon-to-be graduates. We acknowledge the endless hours and effort invested by these students in order to undertake their master's program, perform to their best ability, and achieve outstanding results. Before commencing, we'd like to acknowledge that the land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Kaurna people, and we respect their spiritual relationship with the country. We also acknowledge the Kaurna people as the custodians of the Adelaide region, and acknowledge that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Kaurna people today. I'd especially like to welcome our special guest and keynote speaker, Alan Noble, who will address us this afternoon. We're delighted that Mr. Noble was able to accept our invitation today and help us celebrate this special occasion for our most recent graduates. Most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge our graduates of Masters of Science in Information Technology and Masters of Science in Public Policy and Management. Finally, to family and friends, welcome to Carnegie Mellon University, Australia. We appreciate your support and thank you for attending this special event in honor of our graduates. Whether you are physically here with us in this wonderful facility at the Science Exchange or whether you're watching via internet. At this stage, we'd hope to have a message from the Dean of Heinz College, Professor Ramaya Krishnan. Unfortunately, urgent personal matters have intervened and make it impossible for Dean Krishnan to send his message to the graduates here today. He does, however, send his sincere congratulations and best wishes to all of the graduating students. I'd like now to call on Professor Riaz Esmalzeda to introduce our guest speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Mr. Alan Noble, the Engineering Director for Google Australia and New Zealand. Um, Mr. Noble is an IT entrepreneur and executive with 25 years of international technology leadership and management experience in Australia, the United States, and Japan. Uh, since February 2007, he has led Google's research and development operations in Australia, uh, which is one of the Google's uh, fastest growing engineering centers and the home of Google Maps and Google Wave. Um, he joined Google from NetPriva, a networking software company. I, I hope I pronounced it well. Uh, or NetPriva, a networking um, software company he founded in 2005, which was acquired by Expand Network. Uh, from 1982 to 1986, he lived in Japan, where he worked for Daiichi, Kaden, and NEC. Uh, from 1986 till 2002, he lived in California. Um, he has had great experience. I'm, I'm going to sort of, you know, skip some of these things. It, it's, and uh, I understand that Alan's going to uh, discuss some of his experience himself. Anyhow, uh, I, I suppose of great interest to us is that Mr. Noble, Noble is a national director of a number of Australian um, uh, universities uh, and advisory board, including CMU's advisory board. And uh, he's from Adelaide, is a graduate of Adelaide University and also Stanford University. And uh, he's also uh, adjunct professors at a number of universities. He has been granted seven patents and has several others pending. His uh, list of accomplishments goes very long. So, um, Alan, please. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here today. Um, first and most importantly, I'd like to thank the graduates for all of their hard work uh, in getting here today. 
um, and achieving your degree. And of course, I'd also like to thank their families and partners for the support that also uh, made that possible. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, just three things that I consider to be important in having a successful career and indeed a successful life. Uh, I learned in media training over the years that you, keep, you need to limit your messages to just three things, and then you, you need to say it um, three, three different ways uh, to get just one important uh, overarching message across. So of the three things, um, the first one sounds kind of obvious. It's almost a little bit trite, but it's so important. And that is, do what you love. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about taking your favorite hobby and, and turning that into your work. Um, but what I am saying is, you should follow your heart and you should have a passion for what you do. And you should, you should really strive to find work that you love doing. Now, work that you love is still work. Um, it's not, it doesn't suddenly or magically become you know, fun and games, it, it, not usually anyway. Some people get lucky, they become professional surfers and they love what they do, but that's a minority. For those with policy degrees and IT degrees, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> uh, however, you can still choose to find things that really, really excite you, things that you love. Uh, and if you care deeply about the things you work on, you're going to be more successful in the long term. Um, and let's face it, work is going to occupy a big chunk of your lives, whether you like it or not. Um, so it's really important to find things that you love um, and, and focus on that. Doing what you love also means allowing yourself, giving yourself the opportunity to follow your own curiosity and see where that would take you. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the best, the best ideas come from just exploring things that interest you and excite you. Um, doing what you love also means sometimes, not always, sometimes ignoring the advice of people around you. Um, because people around you don't always get it. And let's face it, they, as in others, are not you. And only you really, really uh, can decide what is right for you. So, I'm not saying always ignore people around you because that's, that's not a very uh, uh, good strategy as either, but sometimes you need to be a little bit stubborn about your ideas and your, your passion and, uh, and let your internal compass be the guide, not what other people are saying. I'll give you an example. So uh, I studied electrical engineering as an undergraduate, but I also loved uh, the Japanese language. <clears throat> I'd studied Japanese all through high school. When I came to Allied University and I signed up for my electrical engineering, they had a very, very draconian curriculum. They there were no options. You have to do this, 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 and this, and there's no choice. Um, I don't know if it's still like that. I hope not. But um, I was told by the uh, career advisors, no, no, you can't, you can't do Japanese language and a full load of electrical engineering as well. It's impossible. No one ever has done that. They said, well, you know what? I'm going to anyway. So for the next three years, I did a full uh, electrical engineering workload. And I also studied Japanese on the side, so I completely ignored the advice. And I did very well because I worked hard. And, uh, um, but the point there is sometimes you have to ignore the advice of even well-meaning people. You have to do what you love. Um, when I graduated a few years later, I was still interested in Japan. Um, and so even though I had studied uh, electrical engineering, it was my love of the Japanese language that actually took me to Japan. Um, and so I needed to find a job. Uh, and the only job I could find was as a programmer, so a software developer. I was an electrical engineer. I'd taken one programming class in four years, and that was Fortran. So I was not a software engineer or a programmer, but that's the work I could find, and that's what I did. Um, and I did everything from writing you know, pinball software, pachinko software, uh, to uh, COBOL business application, whatever I could do. But eventually, I ended up working for a translation company, and I was translating from Japanese into English. And um, um, from there, just, just that, I guess, luck, uh, uh, just following what I wanted to do, following things I was interested in, one day I was asked if I would um, work on some automatic language translation. 
what I was doing manually, would they let me translate it from, would they let me, uh, would they, uh, would we try to translate it automatically? Now, this is a long time ago. I'm actually pretty old. I mean, this is in the early 80s. Now, for those of you uh, who may recall, machine translation or automatic translation didn't really work until perhaps the last couple of years. Google Translate's pretty good, but it's still not perfect. It's quite good if you go between Romance languages, but if you do other language pairs like uh, English Mandarin or English Japanese, it's less good. I can tell you, back in the, in the 80s, it was not good, and uh, so it didn't work very well. I tried for a whole year to try to see if I could get uh, automatic translation working, and I failed badly. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. But that didn't really matter because along the way, I got really interested in this new emerging field called artificial intelligence, or AI for short, and now we call it machine intelligence. I think every few years we rename it, but uh, that's, that's true in technology. So this interest in AI was what, that new, cu that new curiosity was what led to my next decision, which, which was to go from California to California and then eventually go to Stanford. And, and from Stanford, I got involved in startups and one thing led to another. But the point of all this is, along the way, I, I really just did what I was really, really interested in and allowed my own, my own passions to kind of allow me to see where that would take my career. Um, once I was in Northern California, I, I learned about uh, technology, entrepreneurship, and startups and all that, uh, which I think if I'd stayed in Japan, I definitely wouldn't have learned that. And I, even if I'd stayed in Australia back then, I doubt I would have either. So, and eventually I came back to Australia 12 years ago, and I got what I think is a great job uh, heading up Google's R&D in Australia, and it's a, it's a great job. But the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, I'm convinced that if you do what you love, uh, that's the best strategy for having a rewarding career and a rewarding life. And um, don't, don't do what I did and not think about it. I just kind of went from one thing to the next thing without really thinking about it. Uh, I think you can actually be a bit smarter about it and actually weigh up opportunities. And, and uh, so I would encourage you all to think about, actually think about, you know, when you've got choices, focus, focus on things where you can really do things that you love. Before I share my second message, I want to say just how fortunate you are, graduates, um, not just because you're graduating today uh, uh, with a world-class education at a world-class university. Yes, yes, that's very good. Uh, it's excellent. Um, but no, you're also fortunate because you've all grown up in the era of the internet and the World Wide Web, which again, didn't exist when I was at your age. Um, well, the internet was uh, uh, um, a military research network in the, in the US. It hadn't yet uh, become a public phenomenon that it is today. Now the web, the World Wide Web, is I think the most remarkable platform for collaboration that humankind has invented so far. Maybe you will invent something even more remarkable, but for now, that's the best we have. Um, and, um, I think uh, the web's also undergone a big change. As in the early days, it was really about just pushing out information or broadcasting information. Uh, today, with the advent of social media, it's much more about connecting and collaborating. And the cool thing about that is the web enables communities of interest, of like-minded individuals, to rapidly form um, uh, groups and communities to share information and to tackle problems. And you can be collaborating across time zones across the planet so easily. Um, um, we can now express ourselves in ways we couldn't do in the past, and we can, tackle, we can tackle problems that we couldn't do in the past. What I'm saying is the web has really finally, for once and for all, uh, vanquished what we say in Australia often is the tyranny of distance. Um, it means also that we no longer have to uh, start small and locally, you know, uh, before, if you wanted to do something and you had a, a, a mission, uh, you needed to find people around you locally and build from that. Today, you can, you can attract people around the planet. Um, so you can start big and you can start globally. You can bypass the small local phase and think big and globally. What it means is anyone on the entire planet with the right idea and the right passion can make a difference and potentially have a global impact. Now, that's also a bit scary. It means, you know, you've got everyone on the planet is, is uh, potentially 
uh, going after new ideas and uh, new businesses and uh, and so and that is in fact the reality of the world today. It is globally competitive, but the flip side is there are opportunities to collaborate and connect and build businesses and reach customers uh, globally as well. The biggest problems that we face, um, the biggest problems that our planet faces, uh, frankly, will not be solved by my generation or your parents' generation. They're going to be solved by your generation. Uh, and I sincerely hope that some of you actually graduating today solve some of these big problems that we face. So go out there and tackle big problems, big problems. Think big, think global, and make a difference. The third thing, <clears throat> and this may, say, this may sound a little strange, but I want to encourage you to be impatient. Now, I don't mean impatient in the angry, uh, irritable sense. No, no, no. What I mean in the sense of being restless, in the sense of not accepting the status quo, not accepting the way things are done today. Um, you often hear patience is a virtue. Um, and some philosopher or someone famous once said that, I'm sure. But I can tell you now, patience, patience is not a virtue shared by people who go out and change the world, such as successful entrepreneurs. They're not patient people. They're people that want to do things and do things quickly. It's never been enough to merely think up great ideas. We have ideas all the time. You, know, you probably had an idea coming here this morning, uh, or several ideas. But you have to take those ideas and translate those ideas into action. And to do that, you have to have a sense of urgency uh, about taking these ideas and, and transforming them. Now, a lot of people you meet in, as you go through your life will tell you what can't be done. In fact, the common reaction when you've got a new idea is, oh, that's no good for this reason, or oh, that's never going to scale, or that'll never... It, a lot of people will tell you what can't be done. In fact, in my experience, most people will tell you what cannot be done. Um, if you're passionate about an idea and you think you can make a difference, you have to prove them wrong. Um, and that requires being impatient. That requires don't go with the flow, don't accept the accepted, and... Don't, certainly don't tolerate intolerance. Instead, be impatient for change. Be impatient for doing things better. And be impatient to make a difference. So there's a famous uh, motivational speaker called Dale Carnegie, who is actually no relation to Andrew Carnegie, uh, but um, still a famous Carnegie. And he said, or is quoted as saying, the greatest tragedy I know of is that so many young people never discover what they really want to do. Really want to do. And I think that's true, but I would just add and really make a difference. It's not enough to know what you want to do, but do something which can also make a real difference as well. Today marks the first day of the rest of your life. You will be surprised at how quickly the years fly by. Uh, it, it, life moves pretty quickly, especially when you're in the fast lane. So you have to choose uh, to work on the things that matter for you, the things that you love. Choose to work on the things that will make a difference. And be impatient in, in the good sense, to be restless and not accepting the status quo. If you do that, you'll make the most of it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alan, for those, uh, well, three particular points that I think uh, will give them enough space to go away and think about tonight while they're celebrating. We've actually, we've actually come to the point where we are going to present the diplomas, and we honour each and celebrate each of our graduates. And as you will hear, some of them are recognised as graduating with distinction and some with highest distinction, and in fact... Uh, you will notice that a very large number of them will be graduating with distinction and highest distinction. Uh, and I'd like now to present the graduates to Carnegie Mellon University Executive Director, uh, Professor Emil Bollengator. So would the graduates in the degree of Master of Science in Information Technology please rise and assemble for the presentation of the diplomas. 
and they are Vivek Arora. And Vivek graduates with distinction. Smriti Batra. <laughs> and Smriti graduates with the highest distinction. And I've got to get this right, Chubang Basin, who graduates with distinction. <laughs> Juan Min Dang, who is not present here today and graduates in absentia. Nakul Gandatora, who graduates with highest distinction. And Sam Christopher Johnson Manikarajan. <laughs> Celine Maria Cecilia Patag, who graduates with highest distinction. <laughs> Han Wei Xiao, who graduates with distinction. And Richard Chu, who graduates with the highest distinction. <laughs> and those are the graduates for the Master of Science in Information Technology. Uh, you can now place your tassel on the other side to show that you've graduated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could you join us in congratulating the, the graduates? <laughs> And we'll now move on to the graduates of Master of Science in Public Policy and Management. Could you please rise to be presented with your diplomas? And they are David Cripps. Fred Nanfuria, who graduates with distinction. Nicola Kirku. Nicole, sorry, Nicole Kirku. <laughs> Queen Ha Liu, who graduates in absentia. Leandro Javier. Lopez Digon, who graduates with distinction. <laughs> Dai. Dai. Oh, sorry, Adnan Talib Hakim J, who graduates with highest distinction. Dai Wu, who graduates with highest distinction. <laughs> Yun Zhang. <laughs> T. Kim Turin Doan. and Can Dong Do Nguyen. <laughs> uh, 
And would you like to join us in congratulating all of the graduates? <laughs> At Carnegie Mellon University, we've got a tradition of inviting some of our graduates to speak on behalf of their peers at these ceremonies. And today we have two graduates who will do that. The first is Smriti Batra, who comes from India. She holds a bachelor's degree in technology. She worked with Accenture in India for two years until she resigned to join CMUA to study for the degree of Master of Science in Information Technology. At CMU, Smriti has been an active part of the Student Social Committee and Student Representative Committee. She represented CMU at, at the Enactus National Conference in Brisbane in 2014. And she's also been a teaching assistant on several courses during her time here. She looks forward to her new career and will be leaving CMUA to join PricewaterhouseCoopers in Sydney. Smriti. Do it again, play it again, sing it again, try it again, because again is practice, and practice is improvement, and improvement only leads to perfection. This is one important life lesson that I'm taking away from this legendary institution set up by Andrew Carnegie and carried forward by those whose heart is in the work. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Smriti Batra, student of the MSIT 21-month track. On behalf of the CMU community, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all the faculty, staff, families, guests, fellow students, and all those who are here to make this day even more memorable for us. People say that CMU is like a roller coaster ride. I think that's so cliched. That doesn't even begin to describe what CMU really is. I think CMU is like an F1 race. It's fast paced, it just zips past before you know it, and the moment you lose your focus, you crash and burn. <laughs> Lectures, assignments, projects are the order of the day. Holidays and outings seem like alien concepts and phrases like burning the midnight oil finally start to make sense. To top it all is the housework including cooking, washing, doing dishes, tasks that were all taken care of by a superhero called mum before I came to this place that I now call home. Honestly, I didn't really like Adelaide at first. It was cold and gloomy and wet the day I first arrived, but then, Classes started, and oh, it just got worse. <laughs> but then I made friends, got to know the professors better, and as I sat through each class, I realized this place had enough brain power to power the whole of Adelaide City. Whether it was my internship at Cochlear in Sydney, or our discussions with Professor Riaz during EBTM, or my interactions with people from diverse communities and cultures. The different facets of my stay at CMU have brought along more personal and professional development than I could ever have hoped for. Yes, it was hard. Yes, you had to pull all-nighters. Yes, you did have to fight the urge to strangle someone. But through all these struggles, I emerged a much stronger person. From being the pampered daddy's little girl, to becoming an independent woman ready to take charge of my life. This transition has been nothing short of extraordinary. I commenced this voyage in the August of 2013, and here I already am, bidding adieu to my alma mater and heading off to PricewaterhouseCoopers in Sydney to write the next chapter of my life. However, this would not have been possible without the motivation and guidance of the professors 
and the supportive staff who have always been there to help. However, the people without whom coming to CMU would not have been possible in the first place are my parents and my family, whose unconditional love and support has enabled me to pursue my dreams and a career of my choice. Mama, Papa, I know you're watching. Thanks for being the amazingly cool parents that you are. And my sister, of course, without whom I couldn't have gone past third grade. I also owe a ton of my thanks to my family here in Australia, which is represented by these two beautiful women, who always had my back whenever I felt homesick. Last, but by no means the least, and if I go, may go back to my F1 analogy, I would like to thank my pit crew, my friends here and back home, who, who were my support system and helped me power through this tough yet fascinating journey. Now, as I turn over a new leaf, I would like to thank the Carnegie Mellon University and its people from the bottom of my heart for providing me this very crucial life lesson. It will hurt, it will take time, it will require dedication. There will be temptation, but in the end, it will all be worth it. Thank you. And our second student speaker uh, this afternoon is Fred Nanfuria. Uh, <laughs> Fred Nand is an Australian award student who comes from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, where he used to work as a liquidation manager with a government agency until he resigned in August 2013 to join Carnegie Mellon University in Adelaide to study for the degree of Master of Science in Public Policy and Management. He's got a Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and Financial Management from the University of Sunderland. And as well as studying there and here, he has three professional certifications. He's a certified public accountant. He's a certified information systems auditor. <coughs> And on the 19th of March 2015, just to fill in his time, he acquired a product, product management professional certification. And when he returns to Tanzania, he looks forward to working in the consultancy service industry. Fred. Life is too complex, but you can shape it the way you want. I stand before you today, not by chance. I saw it in 2007, when I first applied for admission at Carnegie Mellon University. Nine years ago, I knew one day I'll be a CMU graduate. I made a promise not to pursue any other master's degree apart from CMU's public policy and management. Everyone here is the architect of his or her own future. And we are here today because our thoughts have brought us to Carnegie Mellon. Our next destination will be where our thoughts will take us. We have made a path of the future. After 21 months of persistence, determination, commitment, and tolerance at CMU. You all know that CMU ranks among the top universities in the world, the same to its standards. We have managed to pass through that processing tunnel of fire at CMU. We have spent so many sleepless nights we even cast our professors <laughs> for their tough assignments and exams. Today, that is history. All the pain has gone. We are now joyful of our achievements. We should remember that if you don't climb the mountain, you cannot see the plane. CMU the mountain, and to climb to the top, we have to endure all the pains. Now we are at the top. We can see the plane. 
which is our future. Personally, I appreciated every moment at CMU and took from it everything that I was possibly able to take. I am pretty sure that I'll never be able to experience these moments again. I hope it is the same to all of you here today. We all know that in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. We have learned how to seize opportunity at CMU. The 25th, the 26th president of US, Theodore Roosevelt, said, do what you can with what you have where you are. The only thing that will stop you from achieving your dreams, it's you. So for those of us who are looking for employment opportunity, we should remember the wise words from Professor Tike. He always say, think what you can do for your employers that others cannot do. Thank you, Tike. I have to conclude by saying thanks to our faculty members for what you have done to us. I personally feel that I owe something in my life. Thanks to administration staff, you have been very helpful to us. We had so many problems and yet you did your best to comfort us. You ensure that we were able to complete our studies. The only gift I can give to you all is thank you. I will always remember you in my prayers. Thank you, my fellow students. You have been wonderful to me. We have been supportive to each other. And today, I congratulate you for graduating. I'm so thankful to the continuing students and I wish you all the best in your journey to where we are today. So let's keep in touch, let's be positive and maintain our contacts because that's the most valuable asset CMU has added to us. Thank you, CMU, my alma mater. Remember, we are the architects of our future. Thank you. Um, I'd li like now to invite uh, Mr. Alan Noble to present the Excellence Awards. The awards go to individuals who've not only shown exceptional dedication and hard work in their studies, but who've also gone above and beyond what was required of them. Um, we have two excellence awards to be awarded today, and the first one goes to uh, Daiwu, who graduated with the highest distinction of 4.07. And in doing that, she set an outstanding academic record for others to try and emulate. The second Excellence Award goes to Smriti Batra. Who, Smriti graduated with the highest distinction of 4.02 as well as taking part in all kinds of different activities at the university during her time here. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one final main item left in the program for today. 
It's my honour to invite Carnegie Mellon University's Executive Director and Distinguished Service Professor of Public Policy, Dr. Emil Bollengater, to give today's closing remarks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Colin. Dear graduates, first of all, uh, on behalf of the faculty and staff of uh, Carnegie Mellon University, I would like to express our deepest appreciation to your parents and family members who helped make it possible for you to attend and graduate from our university. Behind every successful graduate uh, is a multitude, a multitude of family and friends. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a really big village to get that child to complete his or her studies at CMU. And at the risk of sounding preachy, I hope you will thank your village appropriately, and better yet, help it in the near future. Because you should be able to, not immediately after leaving this campus, but down the road, when you will have overcome more challenges, seized opportunities, and found the value that you can contribute to your part of the world. You have worked hard to earn your degree. I think that cannot be said enough. I actually found myself encouraged by your diligence during this past academic year. I usually leave the uh, Torrens building late in the day, and as I do, I see some of you re-entering for the night uh, with uh, foreheads furrowed, others smiling, a few laughing, but all back in the building to hit the books. I realize many a late night takeaway food and lots of solitude has been spent in whatever space you can find in the Torrens building. So yes, the faculty and I understand when we hear that it's not so much an, ex an Australian experience studying at CMU, but a Torrens building experience. <laughs> of course, your struggles and challenges have been the faculty's deliberate doing. It's their fault. <laughs> they have high standards and sought to extract the very best from each of you in their inimitable and often idiosyncratic ways. But you have entrusted them to do no less when you're enrolled in CMU. I realize some of you feel that some of the faculty may be overdoing it, stretching you to your limits. But each of us, of course, does not really know our limits until we are truly stretched. And so I would be remiss if I also do not thank the faculty for all the stretching that they have put in to impart their knowledge and wisdom. Many times, I think, beyond the call of duty. So professors Rias, Morley, TK, Paul, Colin, Tim, Linda, David, and others here and across the pond at Pittsburgh. I would also like to thank the staff at CMU in Adelaide as well as in Pittsburgh for their frontline and behind the scenes tireless, if not thankless, work. The directors and staff are no less passionate about your education than the faculty. 
They are an indispensable part of the crew, of the pit crew, that, to use uh, Smriti's uh, very good analogy, uh, that is CMU, ensuring you will be race ready uh, in the lead up to this moment. So dear graduates, on behalf of the faculty and staff of CMU, we wish you all the very best today as you are officially certified to race and race hard. If, uh, and if I may borrow from Alan's words, to, to do what you love, to think big, yeah. and to be very impatient. And go to destinations known and unknown. Chart your way. Be the architect of your journey. And wherever that may be, we hope that they will be journeys to places that allow you to further stretch. But don't forget about your village. And feel free to circle back and visit us here in Adelaide or in Pittsburgh. We will always be happy to see you for whatever reason. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emil. Um, we've nearly come to the end of our ceremony today, but uh, before we do, I'd like to take the opportunity to present a small token of our thanks to our special guest, Alan Noble, and I'd like Emil to, to give that on the university's behalf. <laughs> Alan, thank you very much for your contribution to this afternoon. It's most appreciated. <laughs> I don't want to, dis uh, this is a, a plaque of our appreciation, Alan, Thank you. For, your, for your visit. It's in honor. Uh, it comes in two parts. Oh. And a, uh, a CMU sweater. Uh, Excellent. Uh, Just in time for winter. Yes, <laughs> that's what we thought. Thank you. I'll wear it with pride. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've now reached the conclusion of the graduation ceremony. I'd like to thank again uh, all of you for joining in and uh, uh, in this celebration. I'd like to thank Alan again for, uh, for sharing his ideas on a significant occasion with us. I'd like to thank the faculty and the staff who've guided the graduates through their time here and helped them through, as you've heard, quite difficult times, achieve their goals and allowed them to see that uh, their objectives can be met. And most importantly, I'd like to congratulate the 19 graduates <coughs> on the milestone that they've accomplished today. It really is an achievement, and you should feel very proud of yourselves. I'd like to invite all of you to join us upstairs in the boardroom for some light refreshments. And I just ask that you now stand for the final procession of the stage party the faculty and the graduates uh, to congratulate Carnegie Mellon University Australia graduates of 2015. <laughs>